Um, it's an honor to be invited um, and I'm excited to be part of this space where you all encourage us to share not only our science, but also our, our stories and to get a little more personal with it. Um, so I just appreciate this opportunity. Um, but hi, everyone. My name is Kelly Williford. I'm a grad student and D-SPAN scholar in Dr. Danny Winder's lab at Vanderbilt University. And uh, before I jump into the science, like I said, I'm just going to start with um, a little bit about how I got here. So um, I was born and raised outside of Kansas City, Missouri. Um, I am biracial, so I'm half black, half white, and being a white passing um, biracial black woman definitely informs how I uh, navigate my identity and how I navigate um, the, <laughs> the world in general. Um, other large pieces of, of growing up that were important to me were family and gymnastics, um, which were uh, inextricably intertwined. I grew up doing gymnastics with my two younger sisters, and so we were spending 20 to 25 hours a week uh, practicing together and spending time, which you know formed a lifelong bond. They're uh, really important to me and also informed my uh, dedication, stubbornness, whatever you want to call it, um, and time management, which still uh, play a role in, in how I approach science. Um, I, when I wasn't doing gymnastics, I was studying. Um, I loved school. I grew up uh, just excelling at it and just enjoying it. Um, and I first got exposed to the brain specifically at a high school summer camp. Um, it was a nerd camp, like 100%. It was just a bunch of us nerds together. Um, it's called the Missouri Scholars Academy. But here I took a class called the Thinking Brain. And in it, I got to dissect a human brain. And it was just the coolest thing that I had ever done. Um, we got to ask questions and hear about questions that people were asking about the brain. Um, and I was hooked. And I've been hooked ever since. Um, so with that in mind, I went to college. Um, I went to Washington University in St. Louis, uh, where I majored in a unique program that they have there that combines philosophy, neuroscience, and psychology, um, which is kind of like three different ways of looking at the brain. And the reason that I was able to go to WashU was because I was awarded a full ride scholarship through the John B. Irvin Scholars Program. Um, and so this was a historically Black uh, scholarship that is founded on the tenets of leadership, service, scholarship, and diversity, um, which were already important to me, but really um, formed how I how I navigate academia, I think. Um, added bonus, this is where I met my husband. Uh, so this is my first year cohort. I'm right there. And this is the man that I am currently married to. So <laughs> that was an added bonus of this scholarship. <laughs> um, but while I was here, uh, I, like I said, I knew I, I liked the brain. I thought it was really interesting, but I didn't, I'd never really heard of research as a career. I didn't really know how you go about studying something and just like asking questions. I didn't know people who were scientists. That wasn't something that was part of my daily experience. Um, but I took a freshman seminar called Researching Research um, serendipitously because my first choice seminar filled up because I procrastinated. But <laughs> I was just God saying, you need to be in this class. Um, so through there, I learned what research was. Um, I learned about academia and how to become like what, what being a professor was, was all about. And I was like, yep, all right, that's what I want to do. Cool. <laughs> um, and so with that, I, I pursued um, several research opportunities throughout college, um, doing different research experiences every summer, looking at different aspects of neuroscience, as well as doing research during the school year um, through the Mark Ustar program uh, with Dr. Robert Giroux, um, studying pain processing. And so through all of these experiences, you know, I really knew that research was what I wanted to do. And I knew that um, in order to do that as a career, I needed to go to grad school. So I applied straight through, went to Vanderbilt University, uh, which is where I'm currently at. And I'm in the lab of Dr. Danny Winder, like I mentioned. And the focus here is on studying the interactions of stress and addiction. And so that's kind of the the streamlined uh, highlights real version of how I got here, um, but it's really not the full story. Um, and I think everyone has pieces of their story that are the reasons, the real reasons of, of why and how they got here. Um, so if we take a closer look, um, growing up, my dad struggled with alcoholism. Um, so he um, was, was really struggling with that. And that was a large contributor to my parents getting a divorce when I was very young. Um, and so my mom raised the three of us pretty much by herself. Um, and also my, my grandparents on that side made it their mission to reinforce that it was my job as the oldest child to uh, be the family rock, to be there for my mom and be there for my sisters. And so, you know, 
seven, eight year old me took this very seriously. Um, and, you know, I, I really tried in school. I was the, the home tutor. Uh, academics weren't really my mom's like stronghold. Um, and so I was always helping them with their homework and just trying to be the, the typical overachieving uh, oldest child. Um, and then when I went to college, um, this is where I actually started to really explore my, my identity. Um, so I grew up in a very white neighborhood. I spent time with the white half of my family pretty much exclusively. Um, and so I hadn't really uh, had the opportunity to explore the black half of my identity until I got to college. Um, and this was also at the same time. Um, I was in St. Louis, right, as everything in Ferguson was happening with Mike Brown. And so this all of the racial injustice really informed um, my views on identity and my views on racial justice and the importance of uh, pursuing it in, in whatever way that I can. Um, at the same time, uh, my mom was secretly developing an opioid addiction. Um, and so I felt like I was missing those signs because I wasn't there. I was sending money home from my research fellowships to help pay bills, or I thought I was helping to pay the bills, but it was actually just fueling her addiction. Uh, my sisters were struggling in school. I wasn't there to, to help out. And so that was weighing heavily on me. Um, and at the same time, my then boyfriend, now husband, um, and closest friend uh, were both experiencing their first experience or first uh, experience with major depression. Um, and so all of these things together really were fueling my passion for studying addiction as well as other psychiatric disorders. Um, so by the time I got to grad school, I, it was not really an accident that I ended up studying addiction and that I'm in a addiction lab now. Um, and I'm also really passionate about outreach and, um, informing people about the brain, telling people about what addiction means and what that looks like, um, as well as doing a lot of diversity and inclusion work. Um, I do, like I said, a lot of outreach. I founded the Graduate Students of Color Collective when I was, um, my first year in grad school, um, I do a lot of mentoring and recruiting through the initiative for maximizing student diversity and just recently helped launch the ladders mentoring program, which is leaders advancing the development of diverse educators and researchers in STEM. Um, it's a mentoring program for underrepresented grad students, postdocs, and then um, having a faculty head uh, at Vanderbilt. And so I'm really excited that we've gotten that going. Um, but the reason that I bring all these in is that um, we all have this, like I said, this, this highlights reel of how we got to where we are, um, but we don't often get to share or take a look at some of the, the underlying things and, and the harder points that actually really got us to where we are. Um, and so I think it's really important to, to highlight those pieces too, because um, they're critical in forming a lot of, for, especially for underrepresented students, why we're doing what we're doing. So um, with that, um, my title, as you, you may recall, talked about stress and anxiety. Um, and you may be wondering why I'm studying stress and anxiety when I just spent the last several minutes telling you how important studying addiction is to me. Um, and the reason is that they are intricately um, intertwined. So addiction is a chronic cycling disease. Um, it starts with a, a binge intoxication phase, followed by a withdrawal and negative affect or emotion uh, phase. And then a preoccupation or anticipation uh, craving phase that then cycles back to this drug use or binge stage. Um, and stress is one of the top reported causes of relapse in patients. And we can also reliably model this in uh, rodents where we can uh, expose mice to stress and that will reliably cause reinstatement, which is just the, the rodent term for relapse basically. And so one key brain region in this withdrawal or negative emotion stage is called the bed nucleus of the stria terminalis or BNST. And so the BNST is a really critical stress processing node for things like mood and emotional state and fear and anxiety and is really at the intersection of uh, stress processing and reward. And it's also an incredibly heterogeneous brain region with a number of cell types that can be defined by their expression of different proteins and peptides. And um, some of these can increase or drive anxiety and relapse, and some of them can decrease it. And uh, one population in particular that, that I'm interested in that hadn't been looked at um, are these cells expressing protein kinase C delta. And so they're a really specific population. And when I started grad school, no one had looked at them and no one had looked at their role in, in anything really. Um, there was a recent paper that came out implicating them in reducing feeding, but my question was what role are these cells playing in stress and anxiety like behavior? Um, they'd been implicated in fear in a related brain region. And so I wanted to know, okay, what are they doing for anxiety specifically? 
And in order to do this, the first question that I asked was, what does the activation or activity in PKC delta cells look like during exposure to stress? So when uh, an organism is stressed, what's happening in these cells? And in order to do that, I took advantage of this technique called fiber photometry using a molecule known as GCAMP. And so this is a modified calcium sensor that in the presence of calcium will fluoresce green. And we can actually implant a, a fiber optic cable down into the brains of a mouse. And we can detect this fluorescence when there's an increase in calcium. Now, when neurons fire, that causes an influx of calcium into the cell. And so we can use this as a proxy of neuronal activation. And so I can express this specifically in the BNST PKC delta cells to get an idea of what, when they're activated in real time in an awake behaving mass. And the first task that I wanted to look at to see what role they're playing in stress and anxiety is called this novelty suppressed feeding test. And so this involves placing the mouse in a large open area with a food pellet in the center. Now the mice have been food deprived and so they're motivated to go eat this food pellet. However, mice are creatures of prey. They don't like to be in bright, open, lit spaces for very long. And that's not generally a safe space for them to be in. Um, and so there's this conflict that's created between not really wanting to go out and expose themselves, but also wanting to be um, have to have access to food. And so we can look at the activity right when they enter this food zone, right around the pellet when the, the conflict is greatest. And when I did this, uh, so this dotted zero line here is when they enter this food zone. And the left is um, approaches when they went up to the food but didn't actually take a bite. And then on the right is the final approach when they actually take a bite. And in both instances, we see this increase in activation of PKC delta cells. And that's quantified with the, the graphs to the right of each of these. And so we're seeing this increase in activity at this moment of uh, conflict, approach avoidance uh, behavior um, in, these, in these mice. Um, but as I mentioned earlier, PKC delta cells have been implicated in feeding. So I wanted to dissociate the food component from the, the stressful conflict component. And so I also ran a test called restraint, which involves typically placing the mouse into a 50 mil conical tube and uh, keeping them there, which I think would be stressful for anyone. Um, but this approach is not compatible with the cable that we use that attaches um, to the head implant on the mice uh, for this technique. And so instead, I designed a new device called Restraint, recording signal transients accessible in a tube um, that allows us to have access to the mouse and to their head implant um, while simultaneously protecting this expensive equipment um, so that we can actually in real time look at what the activity looks like while they're being restrained. And in conjunction with um, software called Deep Lab Cut, that was really um, the use of it for the application for um, restraint stress was spearheaded by Joe Lusinger in our lab. Um, we can look at whole body, head only, and tail only movements of the mouse. So periodically throughout restraint stress, they will move or struggle and actively try to escape. Um, and so these are active stress coping bouts. And when we time lock this to the activity, we see that at the onset of these whole body struggle bouts, these struggle escape behaviors, um, we once again see an increase in the activation of these PKC delta cells um, that we don't really see as robustly when they are only moving their head or tail, really when they're just like actively struggling. And so that answers the question, during stress and anxiety exposure, PKC delta cells are activated. They're turned on by, by this uh, exposure to stress and anxiety. So then the next question was looking in the opposite direction. What happens when we activate PKC delta cells and what impact does that have on stress or anxiety like behaviors? So to do this, I used uh, in vivo optogenetics using this molecule called channel rhodopsin. So this is a light activated ion channel that we can express in these neurons. And then once again, implant a light fiber, but this time turn on a light that will drive activation of the PKC delta cells. And I use this in conjunction with real-time place preference to first ask, is activation of PKC delta cells aversive or repetitive? Do mice like it or do they not? And so we can activate the cells on one side of the chamber and not on the other and see where mice prefer to spend time. And I also repeated this after stress to see if there were any differences between just baseline exposure or baseline activation and activation of these cells in a stressed state. And while I did not see any differences between a no stress and stress condition, I did see that overall activation of PKC delta cells causes mice to avoid the area of simulation more so than mice that 
are just receiving um, a control virus. So they have the light, but the, the virus isn't actually turning on any neurons. And so with that, we know mice don't enjoy, don't particularly enjoy having PKC delta cells stimulated. So the next question was, what does this do to anxiety like behavior? And I used three different assays for this, open field, novelty suppressed feeding test, and elevated plus maze, which all again rely on this idea that mice don't like to be in bright open spaces. So we can look at the ratio of time spent in the center versus hidden away on the edges. We can look at how long it takes them to go take that first bite of food. And we can look at how much time they spend on open arms of a platform versus enclosed ones. And when I did this, I did not see any differences in this open field test, but we do see a trend for an increase in time to go take that first bite of, of food in the novelty suppressed feeding test, indicating an increase in anxiety like behavior. And in the elevated plus maze, we see a significant decrease in how much time they'll spend on these open arms. Again, indicating an increase in anxiety like behavior when we stimulate PKC delta cells. And so that, answers the question, yes, when we, when we uh, drive activity of PKC delta cells, that can increase stress and anxiety like behavior. And so the last question that I wanna to touch on today um, is a question that we're looking at um, involving what do these cells look like as far as in a circuit context? Trying to situate what other brain regions are these neurons talking to to help inform what their overall function might be? And I'm not going to get too much into the details now just for the sake of time, but I'm happy to answer any questions about it. But we use rabies tracing, which all you need to know is that it let, allows us to look at all of the inputs to PKC delta cells. And we use this in conjunction with whole brain clearing and imaging to look at all of the inputs brain wide at the same time. And so this is an example of a brain that I've looked at with rabies tracing and all of these white spots here are neurons that are sending inputs to this starter cell PKC delta population. So this is the cells that they start in or that the tracer starts in and all of these other white dots are neurons sending inputs to them. And I'm still in the process of quantifying everything and going through it all. Um, but so far it's looking like regions involved in things like sensory processing. So for example, the auditory cortex, the thalamus, and this region we weren't expecting to see, this post-puriform transition area that's involved in olfactory processing, um, seem to send a lot of inputs. Regions involved in consumption, which makes sense with their uh, role in feeding, as well as regions involved in affect processing, like the central amygdala. And so this is helping to give us a better idea of what uh, these cells might be doing overall. And um, to, to summarize, what we've learned so far is that during stress, PKC delta cells are activated. Activating PKC delta cells causes stress-like behavior. And uh, we're just now starting to get an idea of kind of how they, they're situated in a circuit context. And my current and future work is diving into these PKC delta cells, trying to understand what role PKC delta itself is playing um, in the neurons and in their function. Um, most of the neurons in this region are marked by a neuropeptide, which can actually be released from neurons and bind to downstream signaling pathways, but PKC delta is a kinase. It's not being released, and so we're trying to figure out why it's there. Um, and with that, I just wanna thank everyone in my lab um, and our collaborators. Uh, collaborators. Um, the Winder Lab is an amazing place to work. Danny is an incredible mentor. Um, and I also want to thank my current and past funding programs. Uh, like I mentioned at the beginning, I'm a DSPAN scholar. And so um, it's a program that funds the last couple of years of grad school into postdoc. Um, and I'm in the process of, of hopefully moving or looking for, for uh, opportunities to move more into the addiction specific realm uh, for my postdoc, um, as well as I used to be, or I, I was also awarded the Gilliam Fellowship um, before that. Um, and they're both two incredible opportunities that I would encourage all underrepresented trainees to apply for because they're really great, um, really great communities of, of incredible scholars and friends. Um, so with that, I will take any questions.